Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Breer, and welcome to episode 112 of the 11FS Fintech Insider Breakfast Show. As you know by now, in this show, we bring you the best and the brightest from around the fintech and banking landscape every single weekday, straight into your homes at 8.30 BST. Tea. That is, apart from on Mondays and Wednesdays, where Mr. Sam Moore goes live at 3.30 BST or 10.30 AM ET for our US friends. Both shows go out here on LinkedIn. Uh, today, we are thrilled to be joined by Simon Cole, who is the CEO of Automated Intelligence. On today's show, we're going to be talking about how businesses can protect themselves against cybercrime, as going fully digital during lockdown has made many companies a bit of a target for cyber fraudsters. So, I mean, good morning, Simon. How are you doing? Good morning, David. Yeah, I'm very well. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the show this morning. No worries. I mean, a really interesting topic. So I think we're uh, we're going to go some interesting places today. Um, for everybody listening to this or watching this over on LinkedIn, as always, guys, we love getting your questions. So make sure you leave those comments over in the sidebar. And actually, what we'll do is we'll just weave them into the conversation as we go. Um, so, I mean, first up, can you tell us a little bit about your background, Simon? It'd be good to know what you were doing before automated intelligence. Sure. So I've kind of been in the um, information governance records management space for, for basically all of my life. So I previously to automated intelligence, um, I worked for a local company in Belfast called Meridio. They were ultimately acquired um, by uh, Autonomy, um, the, the search guys. Um, and for them, I was a, a global lead for all things governance. Um, so effectively, um, floating around the place telling people how they needed to protect information, why they needed to protect information, and um, effectively plugging them tools to get that to get that done. Um, and it was really as part of that that um, automated intelligence came about. So we kind of sat frustrated in the market, realizing that, you know what, the way they were doing things could be done better. Um, at, at the same time, I was part of a, an EU body. Uh, we were writing a new standard for records management. So we were kind of expert in the issues. We, we knew exactly um, how this was going to play out over the next lot of years. Industry was at a turning point. And um, so on the way back from a, from a customer meeting, frustrated at, at what the customer wanted and our inability to actually meet that need, we, we pulled over to a, a service station in the M5 and literally on, on the back of a napkin, um, you know, drew out the basis of, of, of what is now automated intelligence 10 years later. That's um, amazing. So that's the background. I mean, you've got to, got to be careful where you pull in, really, haven't you? You get into mischief a little chef sometimes, don't you? But uh, I mean, it's a it's a real, you know, global problem and not just for financial services, but so many different industries. Right. But I mean, why are so many people bad at this, do you think? Because it, it kind of feels like this should be such a significant advantage for for the industry. But I mean, why are people so bad with data? Um, I was just saying, um, this obviously seems like, I mean, data feels like it should be such a, an advantage for the industry, but so many people are so bad with thinking about or accessing using data. What, why is that, do you think? I think a lot of it comes, I mean, I, I look at it in the digital age and think it's down to immaturity in a lot of ways. If, if you go back, you know, 20 years, literally 20 years, there, there was no digital um, footprint from an organization. Everything that you did, you typed up, you sent it out in a letter and it arrived and a filing clerk took it, they read it, they put it in a box in a manila folder and everything was done in a very regimented way. And then this wonderful thing um, called digitalization came along and um, everybody lost it. <laughs> everybody, you know, th those controls that had literally built over, up over hundreds of years um, you know, they just went out the window. Uh, and people, you know, as we do today, we adopt new technology at such an amazing rate that the, the ability to control, you know, what we did two years ago um, has become increasingly hard. Um, you know, you, you think of you think of a paper-based organization and nothing changed literally hundreds of years. And all of a sudden we're in the world where, you know, from your perspective, you know, you could be using Google one week, you could be using um, Office 365 the next week, a documenting platform. So we've just created this cacophony of noise when it comes to data. Mm. And, and that's only the kind of documents we create. Think of then the digital streams from a transactional processing basis. So I think there's an element where we're still in a pretty immature place uh, with regard to how we manage information on a global basis. Uh, I think we're starting to make inroads into that, but um, you know, 
a 20 year old industry um, when you think of global you know globalization and history is actually still a pretty pretty young place to be so um, that, that's what I put it down to whether whether other people would agree with that or not I'm not sure no I, I think I, I definitely agree with that I mean I think it's a it's a similar picture when it comes to the the consumer experiences just from a slightly different angle isn't it the 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 banks have essentially uh, digitized the the existing systems that they have as you say from a data perspective and data has never been something that the banks have have really taken to the advantage of of really transforming how that experience is is actually managed and and obviously like you say going from that piece of paper with uh, you know a, a view of what the data was to a digital system that is restoring it in a much more efficient way but you know, arguably still as still as dumb as the paper, then really people aren't taking the advantage of it. But but obviously, I mean, if if you look at other industries, obviously so many different organizations are are doing amazing things with data to be in a situation where they're creating completely different revenue streams than their predecessors. So I mean this seems like an untapped opportunity for financial services. Yeah, it it, it is massive. And uh, you know they, they always talk about, you know, there's a quote by an exec in HP, you know, that, that said, if, if HP knew what HP knows, you know, they would be 10 times more successful. And, and we're all the same. You know, we, we all live um, with an amazing volume of data um, under our fingertips, but a, a complete inability to harness that for the good of our organization or, as we're all trying to do, for the good of our customers, you know, making sure that, um, you know, all of the things, all of those pertinent um, data points uh, exposing that. And obviously, you know, from a, from a, an artificial intelligence perspective, machine learning, we're starting, I think, to break into that. And I think that's obviously over the next number of years, that, that's where the opportunity comes. Um, what we do, you know, and how we manage information um, should be completely automated. I mean, there is absolutely no rationale for people to still have to sit and, you know, manually read, read documents anymore and figure out what they are and classify them so that we manage it. So um, there is an absolute massive um sea change coming um as uh, machine learning goes mainstream um, on, on on legacy world data so i mean that was 10 years ago you pulled over at the the the, the stop station and uh, you know 10 years later now you guys are kind of flying so i mean tell, tell me a little bit more about automated intelligence then because i mean you guys have been doing some really interesting things in the fs space haven't you yeah absolutely so um, th those ten years have been it been a journey, um, and you know it hasn't always been about financial services for us. We we started off really with a very um, strong background, steeped in you know information. I think we lost you then for a second, Simon. Oh, okay. Um, oh, you're back. Okay, cool. Arena, really yeah. helping governments understand data and bring it under control. And that led on to the ultimate realization that um, the area where there is most regulation and the most need for our capability is really in financial services. So we've been working um, with, with a range of banks um, and doing very particular things, which is really about helping them um, understand and identify the risk that they have within their data sets, um, helping them then apply governance rules across that data set and then very importantly, helping them report that compliance um, back out either into their EXCO um, or ultimately back out to people like the SCA so that they can, um, with great authority, um, state um, where they sit in compliance with things like um, GDPR or PRIN or CISC um, from the FCA and identifying the measures they've put in place, but, but, but more importantly, being able to show that measure and report that back. So, it, it's giving given organizations the ability to not relax in a sense, but at least be able to be very accountable to the information they have and they're holding on people and making sure um, that uh, that they can be really visible. And, mm -hmm. and there's a massive opportunity, a massive benefit for that. And the, the key thing really being when you think of the regulations, people think about fines and if I don't do X, Y, and Z, I'm going to get fined. That, that's the least of their problems. The real problem is the, the um, reputational damage that can happen for an organization if they're not looking after their data. Um, you know, there, there's studies that show that the, you know, the, the stock price impact of, of, a, of a breach or of um, poor information management is actually 10 times the fine. And, uh, you know, we've all seen many examples over the years of, of people having really, um, 
really bad outcomes uh, from a result of not managing the information and, and equally not communicating when something has gone wrong uh, early, early, early on. Yeah, well, and as you say, it's it's not um, it's not just the the leakage of the data that causes the problem, is it? There's, I mean, just simple things in terms of accessing data in a timely fashion to actually allow you to to do that regulatory reporting in the way that you're discussing. I mean, obviously, since the the 2008 crisis, there's been a lot more regulation kind of put around this as well. But obviously, the as you said, the the technology has advanced so significantly. Um, can you? Tell us a little bit about, bit about the AI data lift platform, because I mean, from 2008 to now, cloud-based technologies to try and address some of these these problems, you know, that is a completely different level of capability. That's that so really at people fingertips, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And and I guess one of the the, the key changes and th something that's happening all the time is it's the sheer volume of data that's mm. being creating and accessed, and that's where data lift um, steps in. Our customers and actually some of our competitors would describe it as the gold standard um, for risk identification um, across information and, and applying that governance. And, and really, what we do is we take that eighty percent. Yeah, back. Go on. Then. The information that's it's in their file shares, in the SharePoint system, their Google Docs, wherever that is, and we really help them understand what that data is, and that's really important. Um, you know, when you look at the the requirement that exists to uh, be able to report why you hold some of these information, what's the purpose that you're using it for, so we help them. Uh, identify that information and then not only that but we we then let them apply a policy to how that information should be governed going forwards should it be kept should it be moved somewhere more secure uh, what, are, what are the regulations around that and what policy should they put in place and then ultimately um, the platform has a dashboard which lets people then report back see on a day-to-day -day basis um, were they sitting in in compliance over over a period of a week what's changed what new um unmanaged data have we captured and therefore been able to flag that report on that um, fix the problem which is really important and make sure that reporting um, layer is in place so the, the, the benefit that we have is the, the platform is completely cloud-based um, and that gives us um, you know unlimited scalability and that that's what has been the big game changer in this space there's always been systems that do that, but they've always been very much limited by the infrastructure and the mm -hmm. hardware and, and the massive expense that went along with that. Yeah, um, I mean, as you say, pure, purely on a compute perspective, and actually the you know the the speed of ingestion of data, then actually these are things that are really becoming practical at this stage, aren't they? In terms of actually how you would do those. But I mean, does the obviously the period that we're in from a COVID nineteen perspective does does this potentially open up even greater risk for these organizations? Because many are having to quite hurriedly implement remote working capability, which inevitably means, to your, to your point, Celia, in terms of some of those data sources, um, distributed collaboration tools, um, for organizations to really feel comfortable with what that data is and where that data is going. I mean, it feels like actually the risk of, of, of an issue is getting much more significant because of the distributed endpoints, essentially. Yeah, um, um, and we, we've been working with some people and we've seen a massive um, a massive realization that COVID, COVID's going to be, let, how do I phrase this rightly? COVID's going to be a great thing for information governance, right, in, in, in the long run. But we're, we're in that state right now where people have literally dropped firewalls. They have copied information onto unsecured devices. They, they have broken every single rule that they ever put in place in terms of how they should manage information. So uh, the kind of world, the world and people's you know, kitchens and dining rooms are now awash with information that was never designed to leave you know, a two foot cube uh, you know, some, somewhere in the center of London ultimately. And um, the, the reality is that, yes, inf information has spread um, out of control in some senses. Now, yeah, Max, Simon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I assume when the screen goes blank, you lose me. So I do. For, for just two <laughs> seconds, I think it is. I, I count it in my head every time. Okay. Um, <laughs> 
So, so organizations, you know, in one sense, have lost control of data a lot more than they had pre-COVID, and, mm. and, and that's a real um, that's a real risk. You know, when we look at you know what the FCA and people are doing at the minute, they've maybe taken the pressure off the the accelerator in terms of having um, forcing people to report what they're doing. But the regulations haven't gone away, and if anything, this is going to force the regulations to be stronger. So, organisations that we're speaking to um, are, are already moving into that recovery mode, which is okay. Business continuity came first. We had to continue working. We had to continue serving our customer. So, yes, we we dropped some of the controls, and yes, we don't know where maybe all of that data went, but. Can, can you please help us find it again? Can you please help us deduplicate it? Can you help us remove the stuff that never should have been out there? And, and can you give us back that sense of control um, that we were hoping for? And, and that journey, I think, is going to help a lot of organizations actually start to implement things um, for the first time. And, and as we were talking at, at the top of the show, it, it's going to remove some of that fear factor of doing nothing as well, which I think will be a good thing. Everybody sat, uh, you know, as we said, looking at this problem not knowing how to ever start solving the problem of, of chaos data or toxic data or dark, dark data, as we want to call it. Um, but this has given a real opportunity, I think, for people mm. to say, right, okay, now we have to do something, let, let's jump in. Well, and that's the thing, isn't it? You know, the industry, uh, I mean, an industry can always do nothing when nobody else is doing anything, right? We've, we've sort of found that on multiple levels within financial services. But uh, to your point, with, with everything that's happening with COVID, but actually with new organizations coming into uh, financial services, you know, new fintech players, actually big technology players who are really good at this, then it really does put the pressure on on the, the the big incumbent organizations to to kind of get their act together when it comes to data, because ultimately that's going to be their really their only differentiator at this stage is the amount of data that they actually have on on the consumers, right? So, I mean, so so how do you guys help people sort of streamline that process then? Because, I mean, this is, this is pretty complex. You know, we're talking about, you know, decades of data that is unstructured in various different ways. You know, it is a proverbial Aladdin's cave of like data that they have in the back office. So what typically does this look like in terms of solving this problem? Sure. So, so the first thing um, for people is giving is helping them figure out what what they have, um, and and it, it it's such a big problem certainly for large organisations and you know and we're talking big banks here. Um, for large organisations, they have to just start somewhere. Um, the challenge is people look at this and say it's too big a problem. I can't solve it. So so they do nothing. But ultimately. I think that's often the way, isn't it? I think if um, if things are seen as too hard, then people just don't try, which is a, a kind of a strange setup, isn't it? If uh, if you're never actually trying to uh, resolve a, a significant problem like this, you're never going to get anywhere, are you? But uh, it's interesting when um, that happens. It's not just data; it's core systems. It's like full stack technology problems. But uh, if organisations don't face into these really big issues, then they're never going to get anywhere, are they? But uh, Simon, are you, are you back with us now, or have you? Uh, is your data? Is your connection finally kicked off? Uh, yeah, you are. Good break that time. <laughs> it was. <laughs> uh, you're back though. Um, yeah, I mean, as you were saying, it's it's actually one of those things that if somebody doesn't really face into these big problems from a technology perspective, then they're actually never going to be able to compete in the new world. Yeah. So so they have to start somewhere, and 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 that's reality. So for a lot of people, that's looking at a legacy perspective first. So okay. Let's take something you know that we know has risk in it. We know that we didn't control that system. So let's start with that. So let's look at an old, old file shares or, or a great example or an old documentum platform that's been kind of lying around forever. And starting with something like that, or or else if when people are implementing new technology, saying, you know what, we're going, we're going to draw a line and we're going to go forward and get things right. Um, and, and either of those approaches works, to be honest. But what it does is you start the process of gaining insight on the information that you own, you start to apply the policy. And those policies, you define them as you go. I mean, it's one of those elements where you, your policy, a, a, a policy, um, creating a policy is the first step, getting something in place, and then ultimately building upon that and then expanding upon that. So, you know, if, if we tip, take a typical bank, we may work with their wealth division initially, um, build upon that, get policies in place and then spread out beyond that into the various other elements of the business uh, and, and give them that insight and control. Mm -hmm. And once you're reporting that back up and 
uh, from a from a senior exec level, people can say, okay, right, you know, we, we know there's risk in here, but look, we've been able to quantify it. We've been able to say, you know, we are actually ticking the box on GDPR. We are ticking the box on some of these other regulations. Um, that builds momentum then where people start to want to see that applied right across the other sets uh, yeah. within the organization. I mean, the other side of this, I guess, is, I mean, at, at every point where there's um, sort of slight chaos and, and, and difficult, you know, uh, confusion leads to opportunity from a from a criminal activity perspective. So, I mean, on the cybercrime side of things, I mean, particularly cybercrime fraud. I mean, has there been a bit of an uptick? I, I know when we've had um, we've had people on from the FCA in the show recently, they're saying you know criminals are are loving this period because you know chaos, confusion. It's allowing opportunity for for people to uh, be a bit more devious than they usually are. But uh, I mean, how cautious do you think should companies be in in this period with this type of crime? Yeah, I mean, the minute that you um, you know remove people out of the control that you typically have sitting in an office, um, you immediately um, you know provide additional opportunity. And we've just got to look over the last um, you know the last couple of months. Um, some of the big attacks that have happened, uh, and and it's moved, you know, even from beyond um, data breaches. I think data breaches were, um, you know, were the early attempts. It's the extortion that's now happening. I think is is the real problem. When we look at, um, you know, ransomware and how that has got more. It's definitely getting a lot more sophisticated. I think was going to be the end of that end of that point. Um, def definitely, I think it's getting a lot more sophisticated, isn't it? The sort of ransomware type of things. I think um, famously, I think Lloyd's Banking Group was uh, being sort of held hostage. I think about eighteen months ago, weren't they, for quite a significant yeah. amount of money? But I don't think it was ever publicly talked about how that was actually resolved. But um, but yeah, it's it's a it's a difficult one, isn't it? People are the stakes are getting higher, aren't they? Yeah, and and I think you know the more this happens. Um, the more we're seeing people quickly paying ransomware because they're realizing, you know, that that reputational damage. When you look at TravelX, uh, you know, with what happened to them, the universities um, over the last period of time, you know, that 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 damage that can be caused reputationally when you can't transact as a business is is massive. So um, that that's the big risk. And you know, how are people able to do that? Well, it's not because they've necessarily broken into the firewall and you know broken through the IT security platform. They've typically you know got access as a user, logged in as a user. So we, we do put a lot of effort into protecting our estate, but it, it, it's usually it, it's educating and it's continually um, trying to narrow down that weak point, which is you and I as users. That's how people get into systems typically. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's where we, we see a lot of opportunity. You know, our, our platform is purely cloud-based. And while some people, you know, may say, well, it's a cloud safe, um, I can guarantee it's an awful lot safer than your data room and it's an awful lot safer than, than your average user sitting at their computer. Um, so we, we see massive opportunity there. You know, it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting in financial services that we're still at a place where we're talking about cloud adoption. You know, and it's, and it's funny things that stop organizations being able to think uh, you know, from a from purely from a you know a, a cloud default perspective. But I mean, I, I've had um, procurement departments turn away uh, big cloud opportunities because they weren't allowed to walk around the data center, and they perceived that that was less secure. The idea that they were able to walk around a data center, making it more secure, made absolutely no sense at all. But uh, and the yeah. fact you know Google or Microsoft or or uh, uh, you know anybody in that space would protect their data centers, you know, with big burly gentlemen with guns, you know, I mean, it's like, it, it makes no sense in this context of, of where we are. But I mean, do you, do you think, and there's an interesting point here from uh, Bianca over on, on LinkedIn, I mean, do you think there's an element of procrastination when it comes to ad adapting to new types of cybercrime? Because people often just sort of wait until there's something that goes wrong until they make a significant change. But obviously in this period, you know, criminals are pretty innovative. Uh, you know, they're always going to be focusing on weaknesses and opportunities. So almost the organizations have to stay, you know, one step ahead to really be able to compete, don't they? Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, you know, and, and I think that's where um, you know, part of does the average organization have to stay ahead of cyber criminals and, and i would argue very little um on, on a day-to-day -day basis 
And, and that's where the, the might and the strength of some of the larger cloud players really comes in. You know, when you think that Microsoft alone are spending about 15 billion a year um, on security technology, AWS are doing the same on Google. Um, while, while people worry about that cloud, it's so much more secure than anything you have on-prem and it's so much so, more secure than, than your own data center. And that, that's uncomfortable for some people to wake up and, and, and hear and it's, certainly sometimes in the boardroom, a little bit uncomfortable for people to say, we don't have absolute, you know, gold guarantee over our data set and we're going to trust somebody else to do that. But there's a reality, I think that's facing the world that says, you know what, we, we need the highest level of protection that's available and that's not necessarily uh, something that we can provide. So I, I think as people change their attitude to security and, and look maybe outside the firewall um, for that security, um, what you're going to find is people are going to be a lot more aggressive about chasing after and making sure that they have the latest um, gold standard of where, how their data is being managed um, so they can have that, bring that security back in and maybe, um, you know, pluck the head out of the sand and actually look at it in the eyes rather than pretending it's not something that's, that's going to affect them. Yeah, putting your head in the sand is never a good strategy when it comes to things like this. But uh, one, one last question for you over from LinkedIn then. So there's um, Sinead, uh, Dowder, I think, if I mispronounce that, I really apologize. Uh, how important is it to ensure that you have appropriate supply chain mapping? And to what extent is this currently a weak spot with it when it comes to financial services, cybersecurity? Because obviously, it's not just the stuff that the organizations are putting in themselves, but everybody kind of in their, their supply chain, isn't it? Mm. And, and, and that's really important. And we certainly work with a number of our customers who um, are really keen to ensure they know everything that we're doing with their data. I mean, we're looking after their data, that's their crown jewels. So, you know, understanding, you know, where we sit from a compliance perspective as an organization, understanding who are suppliers. Um, and again, that's why we rely on, on people like Microsoft as part of that to, to give that higher level. So it's, it's massively important. And I think it's a challenge, you know, um, from fintechs, um, you know, the first thing we do is fintechs and say, okay, we've we got to build scale, we've got to get customers, we, we've got to get our marketing, we've got to get all of that. And sometimes that security element can be a little bit um, down the line and sometimes that um, um, attitude to risk is a little bit loose at the start. I mean, that's how we all start. I mean, you, you've got to do that. But I, I think increasingly what we need to make sure, realize is that um, security is table stakes and what you can't do is launch any, any kind of FinTech platform in this day without um, having really well invested in that security layer, making sure that from a governance perspective, you actually do understand the risk of your Definitely. And I agree with that. I think it's it's one of those ones people only realize how important security is at the point where actually there's a there's a significant problem, sadly. So uh, many more people definitely should be thinking about that up front and making sure it's a, a real core, core focus of those. Uh, I'm afraid it's come to the top of the hour, though, Simon. We're going to have to let you go. Um, I know we could probably um, talk about this for another couple of hours, I think, in terms of all of the different areas. But um, thank you so much for joining me, Simon. Where can people find out a little bit more about you and what you guys are getting up to? Okay, so you can um, find out about us at automated-intelligence.com. Bit of a mouthful, but you'll find us there and equally on LinkedIn. But, David, thanks very much for um, the chance to chat today. I think, as you said, you could we could talk for hours about this, uh, but it's been really good. Thank you. Well, it's one of those subjects that changes every couple of hours, doesn't it? There's always something new to, to, to look at. And that's uh, that's both a really exciting thing from an industry perspective and a really terrifying one if you're a big financial services company, right? But uh, anyway, that's all that we have for you today, I'm afraid, folks. Uh, tomorrow, I won't be here, but Mr. Adam Davies will be. Uh, and he's going to be back at 8.30 BST, where he's going to be joined by Matt Phillips, who is the VP and Head of Financial Services at Diabold Nixdorf. Should be a really, really interesting conversation, but have a great day, everybody. See you soon. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.